times they felt pretty shameful about the things that they were talking about, which I think is in fit effectively part of the problem, isn't it? Uh, this texter says, amazing last caller. Uh, my daughter's now 22. I had a flashback to completing that form um, that the midwife gives you. I remember reading the questions and thinking, there's no way I would answer the questions honestly. Sad to think that the form is still in use 22 years later. I think it was Marie, the modern day midwife, who was saying that, you know, we need to get better at finding ways to get to the bottom of how people are really feeling, not just using a questionnaire. But anyway, listen, keep keep your thoughts coming in on that, 80295. Uh, still to come, uh, what's it like to be in a gang in Scotland? People have been feeding back. Things are slipping back to the old ways. Things are becoming more violent. I'm hearing that for wee cousins and brothers that they're rejoining gangs. Old ones being resurrected and new ones being formed. Yeah, I'm going to be speaking to an ex-gang member uh, turned best-selling author on why so many people are attracted to young team life. That's coming up shortly. Plus, do you prefer the rolling hills or the hustle and bustle of city living? I enjoyed living in the city for 10 to 15 years, but I like to hear myself think. There's that whole mindfulness thing of letting the problem come in and then leave your head. And I found that in the city, I felt like the problem came in, but it wasn't quite enough to let the problem leave. You know, I do like a bit of mindfulness, right? But I'm not 100% sure we're going to solve this conundrum. We'll do our very best with Charlie Baker a little bit later. And... It is that time of year. You know that music. Strictly is back in town. But it is also proving that age is no barrier to dancing. We're going to be talking about Les Dennis's departure. Sorry if I just uh, give you a bit of a spoiler alert there. You didn't see yesterday's programme. <laughs> Oops. Plus, our relationship surgery returns. Any help that you might need when navigating life with your nearest and dearest, you can call it expert Rachel Morris. Uh, 0808 5 92 or send me a text 80295. All the conversations that matter. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. We're also going to be having a conversation a little bit later about skincare for your teens. So maybe if you've got younger people in the house and you're just sick of them using your moisturiser, this could be something for you. Stick around for that. Some more music or some music to kick us off. This is Ning. The mutilation mambo with you The mutilation mambo with you And you'll find out before the dance is through Just what the mutilation mambo can do We'll be moving to the rhythm all around the floor We'll put the other dancers in the shade as I swing my elbow round and break your jaw Before I dislocate your shoulder blade I'll pirouette and punch you right between the eyes Then I'll give your neck a little twist I'll make your bottom lip expand to twice its size While beating out the tempo with my fist I'll do the mutilation mambo with you the mutilation mambo with you And you'll find out before the dance is through Just what the mutilation mambo can do When you hear the music you will find me there Doing things I like to do a lot Like dragging you across the table by your hair and tying both your legs up in a knot First I break your fingers, then I break your toes And as I slowly pull your bones apart I'll cauliflower your ears and then I'll break your nose Then we'll both go right back to the start And I'll do the mutilation mambo with you The mutilation mambo with you and you'll find out before the dance is through Just what the mutilation mambo can do
I'll do the mutilation mambo with you. The mutilation mambo with you. And you'll find out before the dance is through just what the mutilation mambo can do. I can cha-cha on your chin. Bossa Nova on your back. Tango on your teeth. Samba on your spine. After 10. Hope you're well. You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland with me, Connie McLaughlin. Now, a new three part series, Street Gangs, airs this Wednesday on BBC Scotland and aims to explore why so many young people are attracted to street gang life. The series is investigated by ex gang member Graham Armstrong, who looks uh, to try and find out what life is like inside a modern gang in this country. And he joins me to tell me all about it. Morning, Graham. Morning. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. I'm going to be honest, right, when I was reading it up about this programme, um, and I was just saying that to you a little bit off air there, I, I'm really surprised when we use the word gangs about Scotland because the word gangs in my mind, you know, goes to some of the sort of estates in London or in Manchester and Birmingham, the bigger cities down south. It, it doesn't necessarily translate to me here. Am I, am, I, am I way off the mark there? No, I think loads of people feel that way. You know, people think Scotland's just bagpipes and shortbread. They don't realise there's a really tough social environment in Scotland. And there's a hundred years of gangs, you know, starting in the East End, Billy Boys, you know, with sectarian connotations and then just spreading like a virus across the West and the rest of Scotland. And that's cha they changed shape over the years, you know. So what does that look like now? Because you're absolutely spot on. You know, I remember um, that kind of period of the 70s and maybe into the 80s and stuff as well, and probably before that, that, that there was that idea of the gangs and that reminds you of the gangs of the past. But what, what does it look like now? What's a modern day gang like in Scotland? I think our generation were the end of the traditional young team culture, you know, and that started, by the way, in the 50s. I've seen videos of guys, you know, and, and young women in schemes saying the same game, gang names as we say. You know, like now, what, what kind of words? Because like I agro and toy and young team and young team though is not like is it? I think is it not more of a bit of term of endearment now? Oh, there's the young team. Like it's become common parlance, uh -huh. you know. And by the way, I think communities are quite proud almost, you know, of of their gang or their boys because it's just local lads, yeah. you know. But there is a kind of darker side, you know. That really, when you look at it, the whole city and counties are mapped out with this territorial um, gang membership. And obviously that, you know, it wasn't the Boy Scouts, it was, there was violence involved. Okay, right, we'll get into what you found in a second. I want to know what it was like for you. You were brought up in Airdrie. Yeah. What was, what was gang life like and how did that start? It started, you know, God, my mate was like, yeah, the young team, man, they stand in the park. And honestly, seeing my head, I thought it was a football team. <laughs> I thought they were running in and out cones and all that. And I said, where do they train? And he went, what do you mean train? And, I, and he says, it's a gang. And I says, I didn't even know there was gangs here. I had a sheltered childhood, do you know what I mean? But then within two or three years, I'd be one of the most prominent members of that gang because I lost my dad young, you know. He passed away when I was four, he cancer. Um, and I'm now this young guy growing up without a dad, you know, with a masculinity question, trying to answer that in, in all the wrong ways. So I, 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 was, I was thrust into the world of the gang, you know. So what did being a prominent member of a gang there look like? What, what did you have to do? I mean, what do young teams do? We stand in a street corner and drink Buckfast and you do the usual silly teenage stuff, but then it gets darker, you know, because people are carrying knives. You know, there's, I've seen countless knives in people's pockets and um, people getting slashed, you know, and bottled. So they're, they're ending up with these really severe facial disfigurements, you know, and, and you're in the circumference of murders. You know, that should have warned me at 14, 15, like this is what you're involved in now. It's a, it's a dark world, you know, and it's difficult to get out of. When you're in that, right, and you're in that place and you're witnessing these things and as you say, you're on the circumference of this, is there moments or are there moments where you're thinking to yourself, this isn't for me? Me? Not at all. No, I was totally committed. Um, and it's that's that's part of the allure of gangs, you know. They're great before they are, you know. And on the upward ascendancy of that, you know, when people are starting to know your name and you're starting to get a reputation, you know, it's seductive, isn't it? Yeah, it feels great, but then it all goes wrong. You know, it started to go wrong for me at 16. 
Um, very, very serious assaulted when I was 16, just get caught off a, another young team. Um, getting hit with buckfast bottles when you're unconscious in the ground. Um, covered in blood, you know, all that stuff. Three of my friends died that year, the overdoses, taking heroin. So it was a very, very dark space I found myself in, really young. And you're, you're being traumatised by that, without a doubt. What happened from there? I, uh, the, the credit crunch happened the following year, so I stayed on at school. Um, I'd been applying for apprenticeships and stuff, but I just I stayed on and then I encountered train spotting. And it was, that, that was uh, the catalyst for me. It saved my life, without a doubt, because I was, I was passionate about it, honestly. I was like, God, there's a book, it's Scottish, it's working class, it's written in dialect. All right, it's the wrong side of there, mate. <laughs> I was going to say, but you could kind of, you, 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 you know, know what I mean? you're trying to say, Irvin Welsh. Absolutely, you know, and it spoke to me because that was the life I was living at the time. It was being around here and I didn't use it, but I was around it, you know, with the older boys that grew up in the 90s. Um, just the death and destruction in our community. So I, it, it was like a light bulb for me. And I just went for that, not to 100 and said, I'm going to go to uni and study English. And that was that was me, you know, I was on a road, um, a difficult road, but a different road, you know. It's really interesting when you sort of make that connection between seeing yourself in a piece of literature, whether it's, um, you know, a, a book or even a song or hearing something and seeing yourself reflected back and thinking, right, OK, there's a bit of a pathway here. It's so important, you know, because, you know, you, I, I didn't think I mattered, you know, whether it was cops, right, I was getting arrested all the time and, you know, the more that happens, you start to be a kind of no-hoper, you know, you're no, you've no ambitions in life, you're probably not going to be able to get a job, um, addicted to drugs, you know, my life was hopeless and that, that gave me hope. It was, it's that magical thing, seeing yourself reflected, whether it's on TV or in a book or a song, is powerful. And... and I suppose that can work both ways, though, because it was really, it's really weird that we were having this conversation. My husband and I were talking the other day about um, some of the younger people that you see now kicking about, and it's the balaclavas. Mm -hmm. This is the kind of new thing where they've got all the dark clothes on and they've got the balaclavas and stuff on. And my husband was saying to me, actually, this is coming from the sort of drill music scene and people are seeing or hearing violence, drugs, and that's the reflection that then they are seeing back and then they're replaying that out at different countries, different towns, different cities across the world, across Scotland. Um, how much of a, an impact is that having on our society right now, do you think? As soon as you start trying to talk about an art form, people say, oh, you can't blame that, you know, that's a folk devil, it's a moral panic, that's the academic uh, argument behind it. But the reality is, it doesn't matter what we adults think, what does that 14 or 15 year old boy think, right, that's grown up in a place where there's no local services, where there's no, nothing to do, but then they're seeing this really glamorised portrait, of like, God, these guys are getting nice cars, you know, nice girls are running around, they're making money. So what do they think? You know, they take that, but we can discern fact for fiction, but can they? That's the question. And is that more, if you sort of bring that right back again, what is the thing that they're missing? They're missing the opportunity. You know, they're missing nurture environments. They're in communities that are broken, you know, and they're becoming broken steadily. You know, they're out drinking, they're looking for meaning. Young men are trying to find, it's trying to find that masculinity question. What does it mean to be a Scottish man? You know, and they're trying to answer that in all the wrong ways. They're answering it out drinking, getting involved in violence. And the consequences are, are serious, or sometimes fatal. Why do you think you chose to turn your back on that? And, and... I never turned my back on it. No? No, because I'm, I'm, this is the natural evolution for me now. If you're not part of the gang, you're trying to prevent gang culture. So this has been a continuum for me right from the very beginning. Let, let me rephrase that then in a different way. What made you take the path that you might not necessarily have seen coming? Education and faith. That's the two big um, pillars for me. Number one, the education gave me the opportunity to, to dream bigger, to have ambition that I might not die a premature death like my friends, you know, and I could have a job and a life. Just all the, the needs and wants that normal people want. But for me, I just couldn't break away from the cycle of drugs and violence. I kept getting sucked into violence. Your past comes back to haunt you. You know, I get stabbed in my third year at uni with a Buckfast bottle and a party. You know, could have been that for me. Um, so until I found faith, you know, and I went to church and I, I, I went down that road, I just couldn't break away. But once I found that, it was an anchor for me and I, and I managed. I never took drugs again. And now you've got this programme 
coming up, of course, as well on Wednesday. Um, you've been, you were just saying there that you've been, or you're going to be close to being around 50 schools Yeah, at the end of the year it'll be 50 schools. I mean, more than 20 of them are using the young team as a, as a class text now for higher English and modern studies. And So it's, it's been studied in school, you know, I, it's been... It's amazing. What, what what does that feel like? Oh, it's just incredible, you know. And like Clyde Bank, for a for example, right? I spoke to ninety of their kids that were mm-hmm. doing it, and every single one that wrote in the young team passed. Wow. So, you know, in, in communities like that, a higher English isn't it just you know life changing? It can be life saving. So it's emotional. And then now from this point, right? What what comes after that? Because what we're talking about. You you found the thing for you. You found train spot, and that was the sort of catalyst for you. This potentially could be the catalyst for other people, but we're talking about mass behavioural change here. We're talking about changing that. You use that word opportunity, getting to a point where there's more of that. Which, given everything in the world that we're living in right now, is is not easy to come by. So, what what's your realistic hopes for what happened next? You know what? If you want to interrupt some right, like gang culture, you need to understand it. You know, looking at the past will tell you a lot of um, information about it. But what we need to do is go and listen instead. You know, and speak to young people and see what they want to say. So we've given a voice to people that don't have one. You know, and that opportunity. Um, that's what the series is all about. You know, I'm, there's two journeys. It's my, my journey into the past, but it's also these kids' journey in the future, you know. So we've created a resource, you know. That loads of schools are saying they're going to watch us, you know, and see that. That's mission, mission accomplished for me, you know, because you've started a debate, you've started a thought with young people. That's enough to interrupt sometimes. And just a final point before we let you go. Um, when you're talking to those kids and you were saying about listening to them, what, what, what are they saying? They're saying it's bad out there. I mean, the, the doom that they're surrounded with, with war and disease and all the media stuff, they've got a feeling of hopelessness. It's very like the 2000s when we had the credit crunch and, you know, world conflicts and all the rest of it. Um, so they're, they're hopeless, you know, and they know. I mean, out of their own mouth, they're saying drill has an impact on this. You know, it's changed the fashion. It's, people are carrying weapons. You know, and it is a formula. People out in the community drinking, right, carrying weapons, tragedy comes out of that. So, Are they reachable? Always, there's always hope, definitely, and I'm, I'm living proof of that. And many other good people in this city have changed their lives and their wounded tours, you know, they're out there trying to save lives now and uh, giving back to their community, and that's, that's what my role is now. Thank you very much Thanks for so. coming in. It's uh, it's quite a remarkable story. Have you spoke to Evan Welsh? Did you get a chance to speak no, to him? No, I've never met him. No? No. no. Maybe he's awesome. I owe him a debt of gratitude in any respect. And, and maybe someday, someday might say the same to you. Maybe. You never know. Right, you can catch the first episode of Street Gangs this Wednesday at 10 o'clock on BBC Scotland. Uh, Graeme, thanks for coming in. Thanks so much. Darren, what's... It's not the wheel of fortune. What the wheel spinning off, you know. It's not entertainment tonight. Guys, are a bunch of animals. They need to be locked away. And it sure is a go for a win for We stab them in the left leg. It's eight evil egos who love the world. What's a flank? Sunday mornings at 9 on TV 55. You're listening to BBC Radio Scotland with me, Connie McLaughlin. I'm going to be joined shortly by psychotherapist Rachel Morris for the return of our relationship surgery. We're going to be talking about romantic, platonic and even professional relationships, actually. So whatever dilemma or question you've got, you can get them in right now for Rachel. You can give us a call 0808 592 95 or you can send me a text on 80295. And it's a popular trend, but what are the rules when it comes to teen skincare? We'll get more on that shortly. Shortly after this. I owe you. Now I'm ready to pay you. You ready for this? <laughs> you look and your mama too. I can't stand you one of you. I ain't lying, I'm telling the truth. I feel the same about your grandma. Seven years, I 
80295. Standard message rates apply. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. I was just having an extra wee chat with Graham there. That's quite a remarkable story, isn't it? Someone taking something that was a really difficult part of their life, turning it into something that, you know, he's hoping is going to help an awful lot of people. First episodes of that, uh, as I mentioned, Street Gangs, it's the first one is Wednesday, 10 o'clock on BBC Scotland. So give that a whirl if you can. Right, it's now time to open the doors to a regular Monday surgery on all things concerning relationships, right? We all have them. We all need them. And no doubt some of our relationships... <laughs> Some of them are better than others. So whether you're struggling to get the message across to your partner, dealing with a difficult co-worker or simply just want to find some help, uh, helpful and meaningful ways to show up for a friend, a relationship surgery could be for you. Uh, psychotherapist Rachel Morris joins me on the line. She is the woman tasked with the uh, the opportunity. That's probably the best way to describe it, to help <laughs> you. Good morning, Rachel. Good morning, Carrie. Uh, good to speak to you. Right, OK. We um, The number to call 0808 or you can send uh, Rachel a text on 80295. Right. Um, we're going to be having a full surgery as usual after 11 o'clock, right? But um, before we do that, I was watching that video about um, about dads on on TikTok that seems to have gone mm. viral this week. Um a bit of a sad indictment, maybe, of the daughter or child father relationship, is it not? I don't think it's about daughters. I think it's about dads. Kids. Yeah. Um, kids, in, kids in general. I think the indictment really is that, uh, the way that we have built our society, um, our domestic society, so that women, you know, are, it's still like in the 1950s, isn't it? Women are still seemingly responsible for all of the welfare of the children, the maintenance of the home, the support of the uh, the husband, even though she's also got a job and a career, by the way. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, and, and men have assumed the mantle of that kind of masculine responsibility. My job is to provide and protect. I don't need to know the details as long as somebody else has got that covered. So it's like really, it's that uh, really old traditional idea that it seems that we're still living in, uh, you know, that women's job is to take care of the emotional needs of everything, as well as the practical and um, medical and dental and <laughs> birthdays and, you know, all the sort of needs of the family and the domestic. And the man's job is to bring in the money and be a source of strength, albeit silent and unaware. But I don't think it's true of, you know, I mean, obviously Jimmy Kimmel's video was in America for a start, and we, I don't really know much about American society. But I've asked a few dads about if they know the, the birthdays of their children. They're like, yeah, of course I do. Um, you know, I think, you know, my experience of dads is that they are involved. They are more connected um, to their children's emotional needs, and it's it's not as quite as black and white as that video would have us believe. Do you know, it's funny because we were talking earlier on in the programme about postnatal depression on our on our phone in today mm-hmm. and a lot of what came up was people talking about roles and expectations and how they should be feeling. And I suppose that in itself reminds us of, you know, a lot of the time these roles that have been in place for a really long time, it's very hard to get out of the culture. Even if you think you're getting better about sharing the the balance of 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 tasks and of, of emotional responsibility. Mm. I think that's it. It's not, you know, I I don't like anything that bashes men for, you know, for their bad behavior in that in that sense when it comes to families, because it's because we create, you know, those men are our sons. We created them. They are, you know, they're our fathers um, and they're part of the same society that we are. And, you know, I, I know that my mother and I've done the same thing where we kind of step in and do that work for dads. We yeah, do it for yeah. them. That's we absolutely... remind them of the birthdays. Yeah. How many times have you sent birthday cards to his mother, <laughs> his sister, his niece? I was going to say, because it's, it's not, it's not, this, is, that's, this is not a conversation necessarily about, you know, men are bad, whatever. It's actually, it's about how we collectively approach this together, as I think someone mentioned earlier, as the team. You know, whatever that team yeah. looks like and whatever the roles are and who takes what on, it's about how do you find a kind of common ground that there's a bit of balance within that? And to be yeah, able to I, take a step back as well. It's true. It's true. And and sometimes 
um, in a relationship because, you know, we're look, what we're looking for ultimately is a harmonious family situation. We want harmony. We want peace. Um, and so we kind of step up and fill in the gaps for each other. But I think as women, we do a lot of gap filling um, for, for our men, for our men folk. <laughs> um, and I think stepping back a little and actually giving them the responsibility by allowing them to experience what it's like to disappoint somebody because you forgot their birthday. Um, and I guess we just don't want anyone to be upset, do we? we? Our job is to calm the storms and make everything smooth and easy. And so we don't want anyone to be upset. So we make sure that they do get that birthday card. But actually, we need, we need as, as adults, part of our experience of taking responsibility for, our, for ourselves is to suffer the consequences of forgetting somebody's birthday. We need to see their disappointment. Um, and hear that they're upset that we didn't think about them, that we didn't remember them, um, and, and let that be part of their relationship with their own family and sometimes their own children. Um, you know, there's some, I read something um, in one article. She said, oh, my dad was exactly the same. And I thought, yeah, that's how it happens. We love our dads. They were rubbish, and we loved them anyway, um, so we forgive it in our partners. And then we don't expect it in our sons and we start a whole new generation of men thinking it's not their job. Right. Well, th that's one side of the relationship uh, conversation that we could be having after 11. It can be anything at all, right? So from either the partner's thing that we're talking about there, which could be your relationship with your kids. It could be co-workers. It could be friends. It could be, you know, your long distant cousin that you've not heard about and they've just come back into your life. How do you manage that? Any relationship question you've got for HO, you can get them in right now. 08085 92 95. Or you can send her a text on 80295. She is going to be back with us just after 11 o'clock. We'll go into that in any detail that you like. So it's up to you. 80295, send her a text. Uh, we'll get some more music though. Wake up, wake up. Oh, girl, you know it's been a long time since we linked up and we got wild. Next day, everybody with the same line. Girl, you have the whole place going up like.
It is uh, 10.30 here at BBC Radio Scotland. I hope you're having a good morning so far. Now, here's a question for you, right? How old were you when you first started using skincare products, right? Mm, I don't know, 8, 9, 10, 12, 25? <laughs> There's maybe a bit of a, a, a balance in there somewhere about when the right time is. Let's find out, right? Because our latest call on beauty journalist and author Sally Hughes has called for teen skincare products to be simple to use, gentle on the skin and also eco-friendly. But um, just how necessary is skincare for teens? And when do you know actually what the right thing is to offer? And I guess at what time? Sally joins us now. Morning, Sally. Good morning. Thanks so much for coming on. Um, we've also got Dr Emma Wedgworth, who's a consultant dermatologist. Morning, Emma. Good morning. Right, we all can think back to a time, Sally, when Clearasil adverts were on our TV screens and other uh, products are available, of course. But, you know, it was the teens trying to manage the odd spot here or there. And that's sort of how it was marketed. Have we sort of moved on since that point? Sally? Hi. I'm sure Clearasil has helped a lot of children in their time and there's nothing wrong with that. I think at the same time that lots of people were buying those products as young people, there were also lots of kids with things like acne who were being ignored. I think for a long time, acne was just thought of part and parcel of growing up rather than proper medical treatment given. So an awareness around skin has always been there, but I think it's only now that the adults are really taking it seriously for young people. What are you seeing in terms of, of products that are out there then? Are we becoming a little bit more savvy? Are teens becoming more savvy when it comes to skincare? Well, the industry would tell you, the beauty industry would tell you, yes, that children and kids are now really sophisticated when it comes to consumer products. I would say no, because I have teenagers, they watch TikTok, and I'm frankly terrified by the amount of misinformation around skin that goes on on TikTok. So I would say there's a difference between um, an awareness and a knowledge. There's a huge amount of awareness, but not very much knowledge, I'd say. What sort of things have you seen that's concerned you? Oh, all sorts of crazy things, all sorts of crazy things to put on your skin. You know, toothpaste, deodorant, perfume, hair products, that kind of thing. Just very, very, very strange skincare hacks, misinformation around sun care, uh, misinformation around moisturisers, people with acne being told to put petroleum jelly all over their face, that kind of thing that just slightly makes my hair curl when I have to see it over my son's shoulder. <laughs> Although, to be fair, the toothpaste one, I think, is an old one. I remember people telling me that years ago, if you've got a spot, you rub a bit of toothpaste on it and it dries it out, whether it actually works. as Well, yeah. Emma, you can tell us, does that work? No, it absolutely doesn't work. <laughs> and actually, toothpaste can be associated with a whole different problem, which is something that we call perioral dermatitis. So I absolutely av would avoid the toothpaste on spots hack. OK. What sort of things then, whenever you're a teenager, should what, what does your skin need, particularly at that time when it's changing, there's so much hormonal change in the body? I mean, it's fascinating how much our skin changes at puberty. So we'll find that our microbiome, the balance of bacteria on our skin changes quite dramatically. Our sebum production, our oil production really wakes up. So when we are dealing with teen skin, we have to, first of all, look at every teen differently because not every single teen has exactly the same skin. It's the same as with all adults. We, we will all have a different skin type. But just a really gentle cleanse, moisturizer is needed, and sun protection is a great place to start for most teens. And, and is it the same for boys and girls? Does it matter? Is it sort of genderless? What's well, How would you be approaching this if you're a parent out there of a teen and you're thinking, I'd like to try and help boost their skin care or start their skin yeah. care routine? I, mean, I have one of each. Um, so I have a boy and a girl in their teen years. And actually, the needs are quite similar. I mean, what we will find is that more boys than girls will get acne, and particularly the more severe acne throughout um, teen years. Um, and I think often, um, very stereotypically, but often is the case that, that boys can sometimes be a little bit more reluctant. Um, so I would encourage both genders to get into really good um, skin habits um, as early as possible. Right. If you're having your lunch um, or you are, I don't know, maybe have, having anything to eat, close your ears for a second. Um, but Emma, what about the old squeezing? 
No, absolutely not. Um, when you look at risk factors for scarring with acne, squeezing is um, one of the risk factors. So if you squeeze, you're more likely to have acne scars. So no squeezing either from the teens or from the parents. Because I, I remember when I was younger, um, Sally, I don't know if, or, or Emma, if either of the two of you remember this, but you used to get this little sort of... Um, it was almost like a, a tape for your nose. And I remember it, it being really targeted in like sort of teenage magazines at the time where you sort of, it, it helped you with blackheads and this sort of difference. And you could sort of, you peel it off and you were supposed to be able to see the sort of remnants of what came off uh, your skin. Do the two of you remember that? Yeah, so pore strips were absolutely yeah. huge. And look, they are very, very, very satisfying to see all that gunk <laughs> coming out of your nose. I understand why people like them. Unfortunately, um, they take everything else with them. So they're not very good for your skin barrier because they take all the good stuff, all the protective oils, all the kind of good bacteria on your face. They basically take everything but the kitchen sink off your skin. And then it's vulnerable. It's a kind of in a weakened, vulnerable state. And then you put products over the top and pretty much you're back to square one. What about the balance then, Sally, of, of what we should be doing in terms of, you know, products that are out there right now? Do we need to be spending an awful lot of money or, you know, are you trying to sort of discourage your kids from using your, you know, expensive moisturiser or things that are in your, your cabinet in your bathroom? You definitely don't need to spend a lot of money. And in fact, I just feel so sad when I look at TikTok and I see these 13-year-old girls using £80 anti-ageing moisturisers. You know, it's cracking an egg with a hammer and costing an absolute fortune in the process. What you need, I agree with everything Emma just said. You need something so, so simple and gentle. We're assuming that there's no medical condition going on mm. like acne, which is a doctor's issue. But if we're just talking about day-to-day -day skincare, super simple, quite bland, really easy to follow. Because I agree with Emma, it's really about setting up good habits for later. So proper cleansing and protection from the skin. And what can they manage? You know, think about, you know, you mentioned squeezing. Think about how many times a day you see your teenager wash their hands. I'm going to say not very often. So you really don't want them to be interfering too much with it. Oh, I think we've lost Sally's line there. Uh, we'll, try and, we'll try and get Sally back. Emma, um, just on the back of what Sally was saying there about this idea of, I guess, price point um, and, and what sort of products they should be using. I, I remember I remember quite recently my niece saying to me about using hyaluronic acid and she's 19 and I'm thinking, I'm pretty certain that you don't need that. But again, I'm not a dermatologist. Yeah, I, you certainly do not need to spend a lot of money. I mean, we are in a cost of living crisis. We don't want our teenagers to set up very expensive, unsustainable habits. And you just simply don't need it. I'm a dermatologist. My children will use really quite stripped back products. Yeah. Um, we also don't want to create a generation of teenagers who are incredibly focused on the way they look and their image um, and to put too much focus. So as much as I want my children to have healthy skin, I also really try and avoid excessive focus on their appearance or their image or anything like that. Would they use products like, so would you, would you be talking about, you know, if you were saying to them, right, we, we want to look after our skin because it's a part of the body and it's part of your overall healthcare routine. What are we talking about? Sort of a, a, a face wash and a moisturiser or a face wash, a toner and a moisturiser? What sort of things would you anticipate that your average teen should be uh, using or would benefit from? Yeah, I, I think just for many of them, um, a face wash and a moisturiser. And then if they're in direct sunlight, then sun protection. So really trying to get them into those sorts of habits. Um, but as Sally said, I mean, we know a huge proportion of teenagers will suffer from spots and that's easily treatable. So if they do need some form of treatment for spots, then adding something in or if they've got excessively sensitive skin and they need something treated for that, then that's absolutely fine. But for your average teenager who hasn't got any major issues, cleansing, moisturising and sun protection. And that's really all you need. Sally, I, I guess at this point, it's about trying to educate as much as possible, which is not easy because, as you mentioned at the beginning of this conversation, there's an awful lot of information out there that might not have as much basis as talking to actually, you know, like someone like Emma, who's a dermatologist. Yes, and I think the name of the game really is about setting up good habits for later more than it is about tackling anything big now. If 
a child or a teenager has relatively healthy skin, just the odd spot here and there, you're really exactly what Emma said, just talking about cleansing and protection, protecting from the sun and getting them, I suppose, to engage with all aspects of their health, their skin just being one of them. Um, but the idea of them spending, you know, a fortune on an anti-aging cream it, it is just really depressing to me. Simple, simple and bland is the name of the game. And just doing it, I think with any skincare for anybody, really 90% of it is doing it more than the products themselves. Are you going to get up and do it uh, <laughs> twice a day? That's the most important thing. The days of soap and water and a face cloth gone. <laughs> I'm still a face cloth user. <laughs> what was that, Sally? I'm still a devoted face cloth user and have been for 30 odd years. Oh, Emma, Emma, what do you use just finally? Oh, I don't mind face cloths at all, Sally. I just don't like soaps very much. I mean, in fact, some of the newer soaps are not so bad, but it, originally the soap was really quite damaging for skin barrier. Mm, dry, dry your skin. Exactly mm. right. It, it, it significantly increases the pH of the skin, which really affects the acid mantle and the skin barrier. Well, there you go. Face cloths are fine. Soap, not so much for your face. Right. Thank you, both of you. Thank you. That was uh, Sally Hughes, columnist and author, and Dr. Emma Wedgworth, their consultant dermatologist. I think the main message is there it doesn't have to really be too sort of complicated. Face wash, a bit of moisturiser, a bit of, bit of SPF 50, and you're done. European dreams live here. Are your clothes too tight for you now and sit lonely in a wardrobe waiting for the day that you lose weight and fit into them properly? Well, if that sounds like you, you need to start eating less and exercising more, you lazy fat flump. Research proves that eating less and moving around more can be a significant aid to weight loss. So what are you waiting for? Put the crisps down and get out of bed and make today the first day of your new life. Healthy listeners live longer, and that's good for radio ratings. So help us to help you and eat less food with The Chris Moyle Show, only on Radio 1. It's 10 to 11 here on BBC Radio Scotland. It's Connie with you until midday today. Psychotherapist Rachel Morris is back just after 11 just to take any of your questions, anything at all. You want to manage stress as a couple, trying to support maybe a relative through difficult times. Whatever your relationship question is, you can get in touch right now. You can give me a call 08085 92 95 00 or you can send a text 80295. Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 92 Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. This is BBC Radio Scotland. A woman, she's getting kind of fat. That's all right, Bobby Ray. Like a black bat, she's my big hip woman. Prettiest thing you ever seen. She's my TV mama, the one with the big white screen. Built like a brick house. Up on the ground. Every time I see her, my love come down. She's my big hip woman. Pretty thing you ever see. She's my TV mama, the one with the big white screen. Thirty-six, twenty-four. Three in the hip, made me just a little bit more. She's my big hip woman, prettiest thing you ever seen. She's my TV mama, the one with the big wide screen. When the dress that the sun comes shining through. Couldn't believe all that that belongs to you. She's my big hip woman, prettiest thing you ever seen. She's my TV mama, the one with the big white screen.
Pretty face. She may be picking up a little weight, but it's all in the right place. She's mine. Big hip woman. Pretty thing you ever seen. She's my TV mama. The one with the big white screen. Little in the way. Like a waltz, deep across the hip, like a stallion horn. She's my big hip woman, prettiest thing you ever seen. She still got a big old, you know what? She's my big hip woman, one with the big wide screen. She's my TV mama, you know the kind I mean. Hold on, TV mama. This is coming up to 5 to 11 and it's not too long ago being able to charge your car at a public charge point wasn't too uncommon. But uh, since the spike in energy costs, free access points have uh, gotten a wee bit rarer and your new shiny electric vehicle might not be as cheap to run as you might have hoped. So are there still free car charges to be had out there? How do you find them? And what is the electric vehicle charging etiquette these days? Uh, joining me to have a chat about this is Amanda Stretton, motoring expert and James Chung, electric car owner. Morning, both of you. Good morning. Good morning. Mm, right, James, I'm going to ask you first if you found a way to sort of round the um, lack of free charging available. What's the hacks? Um, well, for myself, I've actually got uh, solar panels and a home battery, so um, I'm actually, believe it or not, it's actually sunny in Livingston right now. Wow, well, so okay, good. I'm actually charging my car <laughs> at the moment, so that's one way of getting free electricity. Um, yeah. It's not as easy as it used to be, Amanda, is it? No, I think that, James, that sounds like you've you've hit Tried the nail to. on the head there. Absolutely. <laughs> well done, you. Um, no, no, you're absolutely right. It is getting harder. Um, what we saw uh, some years ago were plenty of, well, I say plenty, many more free charging uh, spots for your EV um, because it was a way of incentivizing people to make that decision as more and more of us are now moving into electric cars. And, of course, the cost of energy is going up those uh, free charges are getting fewer and harder to find. But um, I was actually doing a bit of re reading back in April this year. Still, 8.5% of the charges in the country that are registered as public charges are actually free to use. It just does take a little bit of searching to try and find them. Okay. How do you get to a point where you uh, like you can easily find them? Is there are there apps for this or uh, educate me as a non EV driver? <laughs> there are there are apps. Um, you've got to be quite savvy, and there are various different apps um, that that can help you find them. Um, but really, you've got to sort of you've really got to understand where to look. Um, interestingly enough, um, Scotland actually has the highest number of free uh, uh, charges that are actually free to use. Um, so well done, Scotland. We're but a generous really, I think bunch, you're... us, Amanda. Sorry? We're a generous bunch. You are a generous mm. bunch. I'm saying well done you because you are, you are, <laughs> you've got the highest number. Mm -hmm. um, but car parks are very good. You can find free charging in dealerships. Um, and sometimes if you're staying in a hotel. Now, obviously, if you are regularly charging your EV and you're needing to do this on a daily basis, um, that might not be really feasible. Um, so you may want to look at places like supermarkets or leisure centres. Um, and some retail car parks as well, they will have free charges. Um, so it's worth having a good look round and using all of the apps available because um, you never know. The danger, of course, is that those charges are going to be um, busy. <laughs> so you may have to find that you either have to queue and wait for them or charge maybe uh, late at night when it's not so convenient. Oh, James, was the etiquette around charging right because would, would you I mean would you go to a friend's house and like hook up with their charger even though the electricity is coming from their house how, how does it all work 
Um, well, um, if you're actually using your friend's charger, you should really be asking them. Well, actually, they should be offering it more than you asking for it. OK. Uh, for myself, uh, I, don't, I don't normally charge when I go to other people's houses. Um, but if you go to the charge point and there's a queue, there, there is an etiquette of waiting as well. And also um, EVs, when they charge a certain level, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, they slow down in charge speed, so it's um, polite to, to move on if you can. Or, I mean, if you need to charge to 100%, then that's fair enough, but, yeah, yeah that's one of the etiquettes. Have you found it difficult to charge it? I mean, has, has there been moments where you're like, oh, goodness, I'm, I'm not going to get to where I need to get to? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, for long distance, like, whenever uh, I went down to France um, this year, and most of the charging all the way down was um, uh, not, not occupied. So there's only about uh, two occasions where I was waiting, and the wait time was about 10 minutes because a lot of the EVs these days actually charge really quickly. So, for instance, my car can charge from 10 to 80% in uh, 18 minutes. Oh, that's quick, isn't it? And Amanda, on that that point, just just before we uh, we go to the news, what, what's if you've got any sort of tips for anyone who's maybe just new to this EV game and thinking, right, I'd like to try and save some money, uh, you know, apart from sort of seeking out those free points, is there ways that you can, uh, I don't know, what, what, yes. not being an EV driver, I don't know what they would be. Well, I think the first thing to understand is if you want to make the switch, it's that not all electric cars are the same. So it really depends on the mileage that you're going to do and the way you use your car. So if you need just short distances, you can get yourself a, a little runabout. Uh, otherwise, you need to look at a car with a bigger battery that can mm. charge faster. Okay. But getting a good electricity tariff at home, that's probably the best thing you can that's do. That's a good place to start, right? Amanda, James, thanks for your time this morning. questions are welcome. There's still time to get in touch with her. Uh, you can give her a call 0885 92 95 00 or send a text on 80295. Plus, are you for the rolling hills of the country or the hustle and bustle of city living? I enjoyed living in the city for 10 to 15 years, but I like to hear myself think. There's that whole mindfulness thing of letting the problem come in and then leave your head. And I found that in the city, I feel like the problem came in, but it wasn't quite enough to let the problem leave. Where do you sit on this? Text me, 80295, because more people are leaving cities since the pandemic. We'll hear more about the city v country debate with Charlie Baker a little bit later on. I actually wondered about how many people are now coming back to the city after doing the sort of pandemic thing in the countryside and then, you know, thinking, actually, I need to be closer to a supermarket or people or whatever. Uh, we'll talk about that later and... <laughs> Um, we'll discuss the fact that it is apparently proving that age is no barrier when it comes to dancing. We'll talk about that before 12. All the conversations that matter. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. Right, a relationship expert is on the way after this.
the UK. I was also just told by our engineer Ken today that apparently that was meant to be reduced, uh, released by uh, Elvis Presley and it, it didn't and it was given to Kelly Marie. The rest is history, so they say. Uh, right, you are listening to BBC Radio Scotland, 10 past 11. It is time to return to our relationship surgery uh, here on the programme from romantic and platonic relationships to more professional ones. Any questions that you've got about the relationships you have in your life, then this is the time to get your questions in, right? You can give Rachel Morris, who's our psychotherapist, uh, a call 08085 92 95 00, or you can send her a text on 80295. Welcome back, Rachel. Hi. Right, we've um, got a caller on the line. I think we'll go straight to her, Lucy in Forfort. Morning, Lucy. Morning. Thanks so much for getting in touch with us. Um, what would you like to ask, Rachel? Um, I was in a relationship for about 15 years with a really fantastic but really difficult um, man. And we had many blowouts many issues um, we it was a very very difficult relationship for that time and we've split up however I'm really struggling with it um, and it's just some tips please to, to help get over it I'm really sorry to hear that Lucy um, that you that you you know that you had to break up and but breakups are always incredibly and intensely difficult I mean you say he was quite um, that he could, that he was a lovely bloke, but he could be quite difficult. Is, is that kind yeah. of um, something uh, that was ongoing throughout your relationship? Where there, where there was a lot of push and pull. Yes, constant. Constant. So there are. Um, I mean, have you heard about attachment styles? Have you heard about the theory around attachment? It's it's basically the yeah. idea that we have different ways of being in relationships, and there's a very very common coupling, which is an anxious attachment style, um, and that's basically where uh, one person is kind of always leaning in, is always needing reassurance, is always working very hard for the approval of the other. And those people, I'm one of those people, and I'm more likely to fall for someone who is avoidant 
in the way that they approach relationships. And that means they're more likely to be minimizers. They kind of, rather than talk, they want to be private about their thoughts and feelings. Um, they can be quite difficult to get approval from. They're sort of um, a little bit withholding. And that drives some of us completely mental. So I don't know if you identify with that. Absolutely identify with that, yep. You do. See, the, the, so this is the difficulty. If you've been in a long-term relationship and 15 years is pretty considerable, where you have been um, basically chasing the love that you needed and never really getting it or only getting sort of crumbs from the table, then it turns into a kind of self-defeating behavior that we get addicted to. It's like if I don't get the love I need from this person, it's like we put all of the power into that person. If they don't love us, then we are not lovable. And because we've been doing it for such a long time, it's really hard to put down. Uh, and I think that, that my best advice or my best suggestion for anybody like yourself, Lucy, who's going through a relationship like that, is actually to go cold turkey. And I know that sounds really harsh because after 15 years, he probably feels like family. But you left him and, or you, you separated because the relationship wasn't meeting your needs. And it's unlikely that now you're actually split up, that he's going to meet your needs now. If he didn't meet it within the safety of, of your loving arms, then he's unlikely to meet it now. Um, but we do have this real kind of driver to constantly work hard to get loved. And if you have that kind of attachment style, you may have experienced a relationship in your childhood that was a little bit similar. Um, I'm not sure if you can still talk to me now, Lucy. I know that you're in the car. Um, but just consider no, that. I know. I've never, I've never experienced a relationship like that before. So um, this is all very new, really. I, yeah. Um, and, but, and sometimes it mirrors not necessarily a previous romantic relationship, but there can be reflections nope. of a relationship you watched when you were growing up. Sometimes mm -hmm. um, you may have experienced watching your mum and dad, or there could have been, it could even have been your very first love or friends at school, but something in your life taught you that you uh, had to work hard for love. Mm -hmm. Possibly, and so, yeah. Has it been a while, Lucy? How, how long has it been since you separated from your partner? Um, about six months. And, you know, sometimes there's this, this, this idea, Rachel, as well, that, you know, you get past a certain point and you should be feeling better by now. It could be years, it could be, you know, uh, however long down the line and you feel as if you should be feeling better. There's an awful lot of pressure, isn't there, for people to... You know, to, to have some sort of resolution over a relationship, as you mentioned, that's been such as long a time as you have sometimes with, with family members. It's absolutely true. I mean, I will actually give a... This is such a vague indication uh, of how long you should expect it to take to get over a long-term relationship. It's approximately four years. Four years. Um, and if you, if you hold that idea, then maybe you'll go easier on yourself in the meantime. Um, some people will get move, move through um, the endings much quicker, some people a little bit slower, but on average, it's like grieving. It's like a bereavement. Um, because you don't, we're not just grieving the relationship, we're grieving the future that we imagined for ourselves. Um, and I think that the losses take quite a long time to process. Is there things that, that Lucy can do, Rachel? You know, she was talking about sort of hints and tips there. I know you were saying about go cold turkey, but, you know, yeah. are there, are there there's ways... A great, there's a great book out there called No Contact. I can't remember who wrote it right now. Um, but it's basically looking at, um, th at the value in just cutting it dead for a while because we have to relearn how to relate to the world as a, a single person, as a person who's independent from our... Uh, previous relationship um, so no contact gives us the best possible chance of doing that the second thing is to talk to your friends try to remember who you are because in relationships we can sometimes mm, kind of merge into our partner after I left my uh, partner of a long time um, we were together for 12 years and I noticed that I'd, I'd sort of forgotten what my music tastes were 
um, I'd forgotten, you know, what kind of, you know, because we merged together. We sort of, you know, compromised on what we watched on television, what music we listened to, where we went on holiday, um, where we choose to eat. And that's all great stuff in a relationship. But there's a joy in finding out who you are separately from another individual and actually taking some time to find out you know who are you now because whoever you are now is different from the person you were 15 years ago and really sort of study you put all the effort that you used to put into your relationship into finding out what you like what you love how you like to spend your time what you actually need and see what you can do to go about meeting those things if you can learn to love you in the way that you might have wanted him to love you but didn't ever sort of get um then you're well on the way to the kind of independence that will empower you to make decisions about who you love in the future. It's never easy, no matter if you're the person who is, you know, on doing the sort of separating or the person who's, you know, hasn't made that decision to separate. It can be difficult in, in, in lots of different ways. And I think it's about that idea of the... The, the hole that that then, then leaves behind of your time, of your energy, even if it's a you know a positive relationship or a negative one, but um, it, it can be tricky. Um, 80295, if you want to text Rachel, if you want to give her a call, 08085 92 95 um, And we're not just talking about romantic relationships here, we're talking about any form of relationship in your life right now that you might be finding a little bit tricky and you want help navigating uh, that. Um, it was interesting, there's been a, a story um, over the last couple of days about Sophie Turner and Joe Jonas, Rachel, about you know mm. them trying to reach an agreement with with child custody and where that should happen and everything else, and that in itself uh, is difficult. And trying to minimise the impact on your children can be even more difficult if if relationships have gone wrong. Oh, it's just heartbreaking, isn't it? Um, because you know when we have children with someone, it's it's usually in the good faith that we're going to bring them up together. So while we're going through all of that grief and frustration and sadness and loss and anger, um, we, at the same time as doing all of that, we've got to try and take care of these precious beings that we created together. Um, and it's so hard for everything, for everyone. But of course, it's essential that you do everything you can to protect the children psychologically from the damage. But that's, you know, that's a big ask. How do you do that and make sure that you are giving everything that you need to yourself to be able to process what you're going through. You know, we, we discussed there the sort of grieving process that happens when a relationship ends, but also you're making the space to ensure that your children are safe within this and what they're witnessing is something that you want them to be comfortable with and that's not leaving any sort of lasting damage. Mm. I mean, I see so many people come through my practice who... Uh, witness their parents separating and divorcing or sometimes worse not divorcing when they really should have done um, and the anger and the rage and the bitterness that can survive for decades after a breakup from one parent towards another and the damage is just terrible it's so traumatic for a child to have one parent be very very angry or distraught or hurt by another parent and be involved in that um, so in, in some senses, it's about, and obviously this is age dependent and maturity dependent, but finding out, you know, what level of sharing in terms of including your children. So we can't deny that something terrible is happening. So it's about saying this is a really difficult time. And, you know, and mummy and I or daddy and I are trying to figure this out um, in the best way that we can, but that this has nothing to do with you and that we love you so much, and that Daddy loves you so much, and Mummy loves you so much, um, and keeping all of your negativity towards your partner away from your child. Because regardless of how you feel about their other parent, they deserve and have the right to both of your love and both of the safety that you can each provide for them. If you badmouth in any way, or they even overhear, or watch your facial expression, to remember your children are watching every minute micro muscle on your face to, to, to gauge how you are and how you feel so you have to work so hard at managing those feelings um, about your partner if they're destructive so that your child doesn't see that because if you're 
if they feel that you don't love their other parent, then there may be a question about whether that other parent is safe for them to love or whether you will love them as much if they love their other parent and you don't love their other parent. So you throw them into a kind of chaotic, very grown-up world of emotional management that they can't possibly handle. So the best thing you can do is get as much help as possible. Make sure that you are talking to somebody about all your negative feelings, but not with somebody who's going to just exacerbate them, but somebody will help you to find a balance because we need our children to love their other parent, assuming there isn't an abusive quality, obviously. Um, so we owe it to our children to give them the best chance of loving both of us equally. So finding that, so, that, that space for yourself to be able to process that privately. Yeah, and also, and then... the, also in, in my couples therapy practice, um, I very regularly see people who are have made the decision to split up and they want to know how they can best manage the co-parenting. And so sometimes, you know, if, if you can find a couples counsellor who's going to help you to work out the details um, or a mediator of some sort so that you can both feel... You can air your fears, your um, grievances, your concerns, um, and get a kind of balanced view on it. Get it, do it, ask for help. You know, relationships have always felt like this secret private place that, you know, nobody else is entitled to have a say on. Um, but if you if you choose a trusted professional to help guide you, it can make all the difference. It can make all it can make the difference between damaging your children or not damaging them. Just a final story before we uh, before we finish today. Um, this idea of I was reading about the BP chief executive Bernard Looney, who um, has been the latest business leader to um, to, to leave his post because of mm. relationships with 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 colleagues. And it comes back to that idea of, of managing love in the workplace and how we do that respectfully, how we do that in a way that's appropriate. I mean, what, what what does one do in 2023 if they fancy someone in the office? What happens? It's, I think that it's just terrible, Connie, because it's the it's where we 50% of us have had some sort of relationship with a co-worker, apparently, according to Forbes. Um, so this is something that is really happening, and it doesn't matter how much companies try to put their employees off having affairs with one another or falling in love with one another, it's going to happen. We're in these really potentially intense situations where, you know, we've got a shared goal. We spend all of this time at work, probably more time at work than we do anywhere else um, apart from sleeping. Um, so it's, it's inevitable. So I think that companies need to provide guidelines rather than put blanket bans on office romances. There needs to be some sort of guideline um, so that we know how to navigate it when it happens rather than pretend that it's poss that it's never going to happen or that we can avoid it completely. I think but I would say it's possible. Sorry, Don't Rachel, on you go. <laughs> no, only to say, you know, if... if yeah, I would say <laughs> it's very difficult. It's very difficult having an office romance, and anyone knows anyone who's had one will know um, that that's you know it's easy to get into a relationship. It feels so great, doesn't it? But it's what you're going to do if it ends, because you're still going to have to go to work and face that person, um, and all the difficulties that that could potentially create. So you, we just have to go really carefully if you're going to have an office romance. Just okay. don't do it lightly. Don't do it lightly. Um, and also just make it, I guess it's that thing about the power balance as well, which is a topic, I think, for another day. Uh, Rachel, listen, thank you so much for your insight this morning. Always great to speak to you. Thank you very much, Connie. Rachel Morris there, a relationship psychotherapist. Um, yeah. Thank you very much for everyone who got in touch as well. Right, Lunchtime Live is on the way after 12 o'clock after me today. Vary is standing by to tell us what's coming up. Morning, Vary. Good morning. Yes, we are live from Leith today because Edinburgh, one of the more contentious places for short term lets. And as of today, if you haven't applied for a licence to operate one in Scotland, you could be fined and banned from the scheme which has come into force. So that's B&Bs, 
homes, all sorts of things, spare rooms, all affected by the changes. We'll be hearing from people affected and we'll be putting a lot of these points to the Housing Minister as well. Um, also today we have the Conservative Party conference, uh, the government under pressure to implement some kind of tax cuts, the Chancellor saying not likely any time soon. Plus we'll be hearing, and you can start scratching now if you like, the authorities in Paris are being told to investigate a problem with bed bugs. Apparently oh, they're no. all over the city. It's disgusting, no, isn't it? Very. In cinemas, the metro, all over the place. Oh, yeah. Um, I, 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 that's that's probably too much for me to listen to. I might skip past that, but <laughs> I don't want to. That. But pa- honestly, Paris anytime soon. I, I was reading about this actually recently about how common this is, like going to hotels and just coming back and they hop on your suitcase, or because you Ugh. automatically assume it's something to do with cleanliness or whatever. But apparently, it's very, very common, more common than you think. Yeah, a while ago I interviewed a guy that was a bed bug specialist and he said every time he checked into a hotel, he put all his luggage into the bath while he checked the room for bed bugs to make sure nothing was getting onto his stuff. Guess what I'll be doing in the next time I'm in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> right, look forward to hearing from you at midday. Thanks, Connie. Join me, Mark Stephen, as I call... Here's just what you're looking for, The Price is Right, now at 4 o'clock, and you've never seen anything like it. It's put on, and take off, and smashing prizes. So join Bob Barker for The Price is Right, now at 4 each weekday afternoon here on Channel 2. I did an awful lot of reading on bed bugs, right? I was convinced once that I had them in the house and it was actually... <laughs> I made my husband wash every single thing that we owned and it turned out to be a rogue midgy in my bedroom. Uh, lesson learned, but also very interesting. We'll be hearing more about that with uh, Vary at Lunchtime Live a little bit later. Not my story, but what's happening in Paris. Right, coming up before then... I enjoyed living in the city for 10 to 15 years, but I like to hear myself think. There's that whole mindfulness thing of letting the problem come in and then leave your head. And I found that in the city, I feel like the problem came in, but it wasn't quite enough to let the problem leave. Right, with more people leaving cities, maybe because of bed bugs since the pandemic, we'll hear more on the city versus country debate. Right, where do you sit on this? Do you enjoy watching the sort of trickling streams and the beautiful hills? Or do you need to be close to a supermarket and things that, you know, if you need to nip to the shop, then you can go and get it. Uh, Charlie Baker will be joining me a little bit later to talk about that. And also we'll discuss why Strictly is proving that age is no barrier when it comes to dancing. Get in touch with BBC Radio Scotland. You can call our free phone number on 08085 92 Text 80295. Standard message rates apply. This is BBC Radio Scotland.
should cherish for life Oh, baby doing well um well now where are you most at home right the bright lights and bustling streets of the city or are you more tempted by the quiet life a countryside escape or retreat somewhere uh, well the pandemic some the population of scotland's largest cities fall we probably most of us know that some rural areas saw an increase for the first time in many many years today we will try and settle the debate once and for all I'm not sure we're going to fully achieve it but we'll do our best uh, to decide what is best the city or the countryside, right? Joining me to discuss this is comedian Charlie Baker. Morning, Charlie. Good morning, Connie. How are you doing? I'm good, thanks. You're touring the UK, talking up your love for the countryside at the moment. Um, you're going to be in Edinburgh as well next month, yes? I am, yeah. The 8th of November, I'm at the stand with my show, 24-hour pasty people. Do you like a pasty, Connie? I'm a veggie, as long as it's a vegetarian one, I'll be oh, there. Oh, yeah. Fusion food, that's oh, yeah. what I call that. <laughs> Veggie meets meat, but no meat. Uh-huh. Right, okay. okay. Yeah, I understand, yeah. <laughs> right, also with me in the red corner, comedian David Chawner, who will not be removed from his cushy city life. Morning, David. Good morning, Connie. Thank you very much for having me on. Good, good to hear from both of you. Right, um, Charlie, you can start with your, um, yeah. your sort of your call out to all people who maybe don't like country life and you're going to try and convince them otherwise. Well, I think it is all about where your home is, where you look, when when you're in the dark nights of your soul, when you look inside you, where feels like home. And I think if you grow up in the countryside, you can't relax ever unless the air stinks. (laughs) If the air stinks of cows, then you feel quiet and at home and and relaxed. All growing up in the countryside is is great, but it means no friends for miles. It gets dark at three o'clock and proper dark, not city dark, which is like orange dark. Mm. You know, it's like proper dark. So all these things like mindfulness, where, you know, you're supposed to sit with your problems for um, and, and let them wash in and let them wash out. You can do that in the countryside all the time because it is it is quiet. You know, and these days with Amazon, you can get anything you delivered you need to get anyway. So you don't need to go to the shops. So living in the countryside, you've got the beauty, you've got the clean air and you don't have to see too, too many people either. Or anyone else that delivers as well, by the way. Just putting that out there. Oh, yes, of course, yes. <laughs> right. Sure there are other people who deliver. <laughs> Uh, depending on where you are in the country, I suppose. Exactly. Uh, right, David, make your case for the city. I think Charlie's got a very good point. I mean, you can get everything that you want in the countryside of existential angst, pointlessness, mortal worry. I mean, at least the city gives you a distraction from cradle to grave. Of course, we're all going to die, but at least in the city, you can get one of the pasties that Charlie loves so much at mm-hmm. 3 a.m., which you won't be able to get that. And also, whenever people talk about the countryside, they always talk about like villages. It's always how different, distant they are in relation to the nearest city, which I would say is a hammer blow to say that that means that the city is better than the country, because I can tell you, I've heard numerous people say, this is only... 30 minutes away from Dundee. I've never heard anyone sort of say, this is only 30 minutes away from the ass end of Bumble Chum. That sounds like a nice place, though. It's like a Cotswold yeah. sort of vibe, maybe. Well, there's, a lovely pub, there's, a lo- there's a lovely there's a lovely pub there. They do proper real ale. It's really nice. By the way, speaking of the Cotswolds, I remember going to somewhere called um, Lower Slaughter, which sounds yes, horrendous, nice. but beautiful. Yes. So names yes, can be deceiving. You wonder how it got the name, really, don't you? Yeah. You wonder how it got... You know, tw- <laughs> twins with upper slaughter. 
<laughs> probably probably don't want to know that. Do you know what's funny, actually, Charlie? You make such a good point about that feeling of where do you feel at home, right? And you were taking yeah. me along with you and I was thinking, right, where do I feel most at home? And I, I'd like to say the country, but the idea of being quite isolated gives me quite a lot of anxiety because it means I don't feel mm. that safe. Um, yeah. Because there's no one really around you. But uh, is, that, is that not just a, like a, a constant? I understand that. I lived, in this, I lived in London for about ten years when I was about in my early twenties, uh, uh, and I, I, I enjoyed it. And I enjoy that sort of white noise of of a constant noise, you know, and constant. I, I think I could live in the city if I lived like right in the middle. Mm-hmm. Like if I lived in. Piccadilly Circus or Soho or, you know, right in the middle of Edinburgh or Glasgow, you know. I think I could do that because that's got its own sort of piece to it, I think. Whereas I like living where there's, like, nothing. <laughs> because then also you do deal with your problems in your head because you've got no other choice, <laughs> you know. You've got no other choice but to think about what you're going to do next. Have you watched Alone, Dave? David, have you watched, have you watched Alone on Channel 4? <laughs> No, so I haven't. Spend, oh, it's very, it's very good. Where well, they spend, spend a lot of time, they, they, they have to spend as long as they can on their own, find, finding their own food. There's one, there's one, there's one bloke on it. He gets dropped in the middle of nowhere, and then, and then he goes like, "This is my dream come true. This is my absolute dream come true. I can't believe. Right, I better build my shelter. First, thing he does is get his axe out, try and cut a tree down, put the axe in his leg, and have to go straight home." <laughs> But this is, this is my point. Whenever you talk about the city or the country divide, I can guarantee it's always people in the country that have watched Netflix, they've watched Amazon Prime, they've watched BritBox, they've watched so many things because there is nothing else to do apart from yes. talking about Sue, who had her garden gnome Nick three years ago. Yes. And actually, that just shows that you are just distracting yourself. In the city, you don't need to do that. You can have a lovely time. There's loads of stuff on your doorstep. Do you know what's funny, yeah, though? The, the, the idea that, that we were saying there about whenever you're right in the centre of a city, it can be sort of has its own feeling, peace. sort of peace as mm. well. Because actually, so I, I live in Edinburgh and when you, at certain times of the year, particularly not in August, um, no. after a certain time of night, it's deadly quiet. There's, mm. not, there's not really anyone there. And so there's yeah, pieces. Yeah. So you've got the benefit of both worlds of having that sort of, you know, the hustle and bustle and things around you. So uh, uh, with anything in life, Charlie, is this not about finding the right balance for you? It must be such an it's, individual thing. It's all, I think it is completely individual. I think it's where you look inside yourself. On a serious note, I will say on a serious note, uh, in the countryside, a lot of people come out of cities and they'll buy a second home in the countryside. They'll buy what, mm. what they call a what, what they call a holiday home and what we call homes. Um, <laughs> and, and a lot of the time, they don't have to pay proper council tax and all those things. And because of that, especially in, in rural parts of Cornwall and in, in beautiful bits of Devon, mm-hmm. and all, all I'm sure in beautiful bits of Scotland, it's true as well, uh, uh, villages are being killed because uh, mm. nine, n- nine months of the year, they're, they're absolutely empty because people don't live there. So that, that whole holiday home thing is, 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 re- is a really bad thing. I'm sure it happens with Airbnb and stuff, especially in places like Edinburgh as well, you know. But, yeah, I think it's where you feel most at home. Um, uh, Dave's talking about the, uh, you know, it, it brings invention, finding something to do. A lot of the best things ever uh, uh, have been... Like, I think, the te- I think John, John Logie Baird, I think, lived in the... In the uh, in the countryside and invented television. So, so, you know, well, uh, that's maybe why he invented it. That's Lois, that's, that's South East London. That couldn't be more connected <laughs> to London if you tried. OK, I'm, try, I'm trying to think of... There is, there is quite a lot of stuff. Can connected. we confirm where he was born it, or where he lived? I thought he was Scottish. I thought he was Scottish. <laughs> was I mean, he at least I'm Googling it now as we speak. <laughs> So am I. This is amazing. I know because he lives. Uh, he lives not too far away from me. And when we were in lockdown, I, I went and visited his house because I'm one of those cool kids that loves those blue plaques. But yeah. I do. I do think that Charlie does make a good point about there. There is, if you are genuinely city or country person, I do think that those homes that are being left to waste is such uh, such a crying shame. And I do think that there there is a lot of village tourism of people pretending to be villagers coming to the country on weekends wearing their hunter wellies mm, but they're not yeah. real villagers 
I think that's yeah. okay. By the way, I'm just yeah, he was born in Helensborough. I knew he was Scottish, yeah, but I don't know whereabouts and much. where he was born. There we are. So he's a Scottish. That's Scot- what I mean. You yeah. know what I mean? Okay. So, uh, I we'll have no that. credibility. <laughs> I think, I think we we'll are, give man. you that. Also, right. Well, on but, the wellies, on the on the wellies on. and the barber jacket. Briefly. Okay. <laughs> my my culture is not your costume. Okay. <laughs> nice. I like that. Mm-hmm. Okay. Right. Are we are, are we allowed to? Uh, can we settle this debate in any way, Charlie? I think you, you know. Yeah. Final final point to you, and then final point to David before we wrap this up. We will never settle it because because uh, one is not better than the other because no one person is better than the other. Where you find your peace is where you find your peace uh, and everybody is free to find their peace. So I'm afraid I can't give you the uh, searing debate that you want, Connie. I, I hope people find their happiness wherever they find it. Oh, oh follow that, David. <laughs> By by comparison, I'm just I'm not as nice a person as Charlie. I'd say that I'm right, and I would say to prove that, I think Charlie should do instead of going to Edinburgh and Glasgow and doing his brilliant show to all of those lovely people, oh, yeah. you should do a tour of villages, Charlie, because those well, villages need to see my, you. If you look at my tour, it has mainly been West Country villages, and actually, if you look where I've sold tickets. It's not particularly in big cities. <laughs> that tells its own story. Right, listen, both of you. Well, good, well first of all, Charlie, good luck with the tour. Thank you very much. Uh, November, November the 8th at the Edinburgh stand. It'd be really lo- Plenty of seats available at the moment. It'd be lovely to see you there. <laughs> Brilliant. But thanks for that, Charlie Baker, a comedian, and David Chawner, their curator and head of comedy for coping. I don't think we fully settled the debate, but I think probably Charlie summed it up quite well. It's about where you find yourself most at home. Uh, where do you find yourself most at home? 80295. You still got about 15 minutes or so. You can text me before the end of the programme. Sunday morning with Sarah Janjua at the Wigtown Book Festival. Scotland's Booktown continues to draw people in from near and far. A certain vision kept on coming back, and that was a used bookshop by the sea in Scotland. I mark 25 years of this annual celebration of stories with conversation from award-winning authors like Michael Morpurgo. Writers don't imagine this kind of success. Along with live music from the bookshop band and poetry from Marjorie Lotfi. It's half about my own experiences of leaving Iran as a little girl with a suitcase and an hour's notice. Join me at the Wigtown Book Festival. Sunday morning with Sarah Janjua. Listen now on BBC Sounds. Lucy's here tomorrow morning. It's her birthday today, actually. Happy birthday, Lucy. Um, she's going to be talking about, after the phone and of course, she's going to be talking to TV presenter Claire Balding. Um, and it's estimated there are now about 400 different types and breeds of dogs across the world. So she's going to be talking about how you can find the right one if you're a dog lover, or find the right dog for you. Uh, and if you're listening in your home at the moment, have a little look around if it's the decor filling you with joy. Lucy's going to be hearing how to decorate your home to improve your happiness and well-being. Um, and also, is it ever too early to start death cleaning? Hmm, I'm not sure what that is. I'll tune in for that. Um, snooker champion Ronnie O'Sullivan has apparently already started at the age of 47. That's all tomorrow morning from nine. Catch up on the conversation. Listen via the BBC Sounds app. Mornings on BBC Radio Scotland. If it is what I think it is, then I'm going to say it is a bit too early. But each to their own. Right, this is Just Dance by Lady Gaga.
Just Dance by Lady Gaga. It's just coming up to 10 to midday here in BBC Radio Scotland. Now, have you been watching the new series of Strictly Come Dancing? One of the biggest talking points has been the TV legend Angela Rippon's first performance. Did you see this? It was uh, last week. She did an amazing standing split. At 78, right, she's the oldest ever contestant to appear on Strictly. And with the judges and audience uh, alike left thoroughly impressed, we hear why age is apparently no barrier when it comes to dancing. Joining me to have a wee chat about this is Catherine Stamp, who's the Assistant Professor at the Centre for Dance Research in Coven- at Coventry University. She's also the co-chair of the Society for Dance Research. Morning, Catherine. Good morning. Thank you for coming on. Pleasure. Uh, we've also got Nicole Lampart, who is a freelance entertainment journalist. Morning, Nicole. Hi. Um, good to have you on too. Um, are you excited? Have you been entertained by the uh, opening couple of weeks that we've seen so far, Nicole, of Strictly? Yeah, and I, I, I think Angela is an absolute legend in many, many ways for for, for female journalists. She's, she was a trailblazer. She was the first um, female present, television news presenter on the BBC. Um, you know, and so she's always been something special. And I'm glad that the wider television viewing audience, which, and Strictly obviously has one of the biggest audiences, are getting to see just how wonderful she is. What is it, Catherine, about Angel's performance that has had such a big impact on people? <laughs> Yeah, I think um, there's been such a huge response to Angela's um, performance and participation on Strictly. And I think there's a number of reasons for this. So I think the first point is that she's really good. Um, it, that's clear to see that she's she's handling it really, really well. And she's doing a really fantastic job. Um, I think the other thing is, as you know, the focus of this conversation around the, f- uh, the fact that she is older. She's the oldest contestant that they've had on the show. And I think that's really, really significant and that's really important for people to see older people participating and being represented on shows such as Strictly Come Dancing, which is obviously has a focus on the physical, um, which quite often for older people, we don't see that kind of real physical um, kind of performance on um, shows. You know the sort of ins and outs of how tricky that standing split actually Mm. is. Talk (laughs) us through that. I mean, I can't do it. I can never and I, even and imagine I, it doing it. And I had years of dancing <laughs> and I definitely can't do it. I mean, you know, I think she mentioned on the show that she is, or she mentioned on It Takes Two, that she is particularly supple. Um, we saw her doing those high leg kicks when she was on Morecambe and Wise all those years ago. So she is obviously naturally pretty flexible. But to do a standing, you know, high leg extension like that is particularly impressive she was obviously supported by Kai but she clearly has really excellent flexibility so yeah it was pretty impressive Nicole how important do you think it is certainly the way the judges handled Mm -hmm. the uh, Angela's dance because I I was watching right and and I think there's something about making sure that you're not being condescending to someone who is as you mentioned a trailblazer and someone who is you know a a woman of real significance in her own right but we're talking about the fact she's 78. Yeah no I think you're you know you're absolutely right and actually she turns 79 in two weeks um so um I, I think it is really important, and, and obviously we saw most of them that gave her a standing ovation. Craig, a little bit grumpy as per usual, and that's how we want him, isn't it? <laughs> um, so I think they are really good. You know, Strictly obviously has people from all different, uh, who come in from different backgrounds. So some of them have da- have danced before, as we know. Some of them have never touched it before. They're, they're different ages, they're different weights, they're different fitnesses. Um, but I think the pleasure for us, is the way the judges always handle that and also the pleasure is seeing the journey that they all go through Mm. and and i think you know angela she she's not only popular with the judges she did really well on the leaderboard but she's also massively popular with the audience at home and i hope that we'll get to see loads more of her 
What's the secret to that great partnership, Catherine, when it comes to a, a dance partnership? You were talking about there the importance of, of Angela's relationship with her partner and just the, the, the ease that it seems to bring uh, to her yeah. and the, I guess the confidence that comes with from that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think relationships on Strictly, they are slightly different to maybe what you might experience in, in the outside world, largely because it's so intense. You know, obviously they're spending so much time together, but also they're going through a very, very steep learning curve for many of them. So it is a it is a teaching relationship. These prof professionals are are teaching. Um, and I think we hear quite often the narrative on, on the show is about how a how much of a brilliant teacher they are and I think that's really important for confidence it's really important for developing technique uh, it's really important for managing kind of expectations but I think you know that's really a key thing is just making sure that they feel that they are doing the best that they can and that they're getting the most from the experience I think the the professionals always talk about this kind of balance between trying to be really disciplined and getting the most from them, but also treading, treading very carefully, because this is a massive, massive learning curve and it must be very, very intense for the dancers. They're, they're you know, they're training like professionals. I, I, you might not know the answer to this, Catherine Wright, but <laughs> when it comes to participation levels post the strictly sort of period, do we see that increase? And, and in particular, I suppose from this point, do we anticipate we'll see the increase with the sort of older female demographic? I think the first thing I want to say is I really hope so. But I think it is a really difficult question to answer because we just don't have that kind of data. It's just not really collected widely, which I hope can be rectified in the future, um, hopefully with more research around this. However, one of the things that certainly my colleagues and I are trying to do is to try and address this bit of a gap that there is between sitting at home and watching Strictly on the television and actually participating yeah. in dance. Because that is a really big step for a lot of people to, th to actually kind of make the choice that they want to do dance. It can feel really daunting. So we're tr really trying to think about, OK, how can people make the step from, you know, sitting at home and being like, yep, I want to try this to actually turning up and participating in a dance studio. So, you know, obviously there are loads of classes um, happening all around the country. So a, it kind of depends a little bit on what style, what genre of dance you want to do. If you want to do ballroom, Latin, ballet, you know, Scottish country dancing, whatever it is you want to do, a little Google or a little search on the internet comes up with a lot of options. Um, but, you know, there are some particular organisations out there, such as the Royal Academy of Dance. They have a Silver Swans programme that Angela Rippon is actually an ambassador for, which is ballet for um, older people. And there are a number of classes in, around the country in Scotland. So I think... I would really like us to be able to understand better what the impact of Strictly is in terms of participation. And hopefully in the future, we can really put our efforts towards finding out what that is. But hopefully we will see a surge. Yeah. Nicole, I was, was watching um, Angela the other day and given the fact that she presented Come Dancing for such a long time, mm. being on that programme, and it must be such a weird sort of 360 for her, you know, uh, being part of the programme and its new guys. I think she looked as if she managed it really well. I, I just think it's fantastic because, and it, you know, obviously there are lots of moments of television history that she's been involved in from being a pioneer newsreader to come dancing to obviously that Morecambe and Wise um, scene that almost all of us have seen. It, it's a classic moment of British television. So I think I think it's really, it's great that she's doing it. I think she's, she's done it once of you saying, you know, oh, I feel a bit old, you know, why didn't they come to me 10 years ago when I was... My <laughs> <laughs> but you know it's almost like a, a wrong has been righted here by finally having her on there uh, you know and and showing us showing the world what what she can do and just to go back to the point earlier about you know getting older people dancing she said that she, she really hopes that it, it will get older people dancing mm. particularly because dance isn't just about fitness but it's great for beating isolation and loneliness and and so she's so she continues to trailblaze. It's amazing. 
Can she win, Nicole? Uh, <laughs> I hope she gets to Blackpool. Oh, that'd be amazing, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure she'll win that. OK, um, just briefly one word, Catherine, Nicole, who's going to win, Catherine? Oh, oh, you've really put me on the spot. I think that, well, at the moment, I think it's really hard to judge. So uh, I think Bobby's doing really well, Ellie's doing really well. Yeah, I think there's loads and loads of possibilities. Nicole? Yeah, I'd also like to, uh, yeah, slightly older than those two. Uh, Nigel or Amanda, mm. they're both doing really well too. Hard to and see. Christian. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, hard to see when we're at this early stage of the competition. We shall see. We'll, we'll watch with interest. Right, listen, thank you both of you for your time this morning. Uh, Catherine Stamp and Nicole Lampard, they're talking about Strictly Come Dancing. It is 12 o'clock. It's time to hand you over to Lunchtime Live with Fanny and Andrew. Thanks very much. <laughs> It's 12 o'clock, our main stories this lunchtime.